Hello, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Well, I don't want to be. I don't want. I, I really don't want to stop the good conversation, the getting together. I've got to tell you, it has been far too long since we've been able to get together. And I, we, 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 and the Mid Bain Global Forum and Goldfarb Center are incredibly thankful that we've been able to put this on and have everybody here. I, I am so appreciative that you're here. We are all, and uh, thank you for coming out. I would assure you that uh, we, the mid main Global Forum, is going, we will get back into our lunch and lecture series uh, as we have done for years. Uh, we will start in September, so we will have our, uh, just so you know, our theme for this next academic year, 22-23, is migration. So we're going to look at all sorts of issues related to migration. Everyone can probably relate to that. This year's theme uh, was borders, and we have a, an incredibly um, good speaker today that can speak to some of those issues. I, th I think we're all uh, very interested in what Heather will have to say. But uh, so thank you for coming. We look forward to seeing you again. Um, we are incredibly thankful that we have the people that we have here. Uh, we have President Bill Cotter and his family, and I want to thank you for coming. This is, uh, this is a wonderful <laughs> This, the mid main Global Forum, would not be here if it were not for Linda Cotter, um, the lovely wife of, of Bill, who really had the foresight to think about uh, trying to put together a, a foreign affairs-like council in central Maine that would include the community and bring the community in closer. And so we are all the products of that. So we are indebted to her and you, Bill, and, 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 and all of that. Um, so I've, I've got many people. I just have to say a few things, because these things don't just happen. These sorts of affairs don't just pop up and happen. There are any number of people that we want to thank. First, I would like to say, Kimberly, we are going to miss you. Kimberly with the Goldfarb Center has been, Kimberly Flowers, right here at the head table, has, has, <laughs> Kimberly Pl uh, Flowers has really, uh, taken hold of what it, what I think Linda Cotter was striving for, and we are um, now in what I in, in a wonderful relationship with the Goldfarb Center, the Mid Maine Global Forum, and the Goldfarb Center are putting on this evening, and really see ourselves going forward, working, working together in a complementary way. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, I would like to recognize the board members of the mid Maine Global Forum who hang in there. We've had two really tough years uh, trying to zoom our way through this. Um, I think most people have either seen or heard of our, you know, Zoom lectures that we've had, and I think we've done a pretty good job trying to bring in people, drink, you know, discuss topics. Um, we are going back to in person. Uh, so we will be back to in-person for this upcoming academic year. But um, thank you to all of the board members, and there are several board members here. If you'd raise your hand, just, just all the board members would raise their hand. So thank you. This is a, this is a celebration. Uh, for us, this last, this annual affair that, that several of you have been to um, in years past is sort of our culminating event. It's our final event of the year. We really try to bring in uh, a, a, a dynamic and important and prescient uh, speaker who will talk to us about um, things that relate to what is, what is happening in the world around us. And we have the exact right person. Um, so uh, I, would, I would say rather than have me, I would like to ask Jerry 
Tipper first before we do that. I would like to ask Jerry Tipper to come up and he will talk a bit about the Linda Cotter speaker series and Bill Cotter. Good evening. Uh, 25 years ago, I received a phone call from Linda asking me to come over and visit with her. When I did, she talked to me about a concept of setting up a, a foreign affairs type council in the Waterville area in central Maine and asked if I would serve on her founding board. I readily accepted and have continued uh, being on the board ever since. And what a journey it has been. But tonight, my real pleasure is, and my really, it's an honor uh, for me to introduce my good friend, Bill Cotter. Uh, Bill, as you know, is a former president of Colby, but that's really not the, the big significance tonight. And he was the number one fan of Linda Cotter. And <laughs> so, <clears throat> and I know I can say that without reservation. So will you please give a warm welcome to Bill. Please come up. Do we have a choice, Bill? <laughs> thank you, Steve. Thank you. So rather than me telling you about Linda and her passion for the Global Forum, I think it's much better for you to hear it from Bill. Thank you, Jerry. Um, uh, I'm so grateful to so many good friends that I see here tonight, um, uh, and particularly to Jerry, who uh, uh, was there at the founding, and Joan Sanzenbacher, who I saw and haven't seen Joan in quite a while, and Steve, who's, uh, who's uh, helping so much now to propel this forward. Um, um, we're really very grateful to uh, all of you for associating Linda's um, name uh, with uh, with this with you know with your big event of the year, uh, and I'm so pleased that my son David Cotter from San Diego is here with us tonight, and uh, along with Annalisa McAllister, a Waterville girl who now lives in Mount Vernon, Maine, and uh, we're just delighted to have you here. Um, my daughter um, Liz. Um, would be here um, with Michael, uh, but they had had to go pick up their <clears throat> one of my uh, grandchildren in South Carolina, where they're doing a summer program on tech, theater, tech, or something. I'm not quite sure. <laughs> uh, so, um, and we're really looking forward to hearing Heather uh, tonight. Uh, uh, she she has a a rich background that is. Uh, uh, but I guess I guess we're all unique in some ways, but yours is very, very, um, and so appropriate for for the topic tonight. So anyway, uh, Jerry asked me to say a couple of things about the founding of Mid Maine Global Forum about 25 years ago, and my most vivid memory is that I was not in the loop. <laughs> this was Linda's project. Um, with uh, Waterville area leaders, and she always wanted it to be a community-centered uh, activity. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and she wanted it as, as separate from the Colby President's Office as possible, and I think we achieved that. Um, she, one of her inspirations, and I don't know if she said this to you, Jerry, but she was always interested in bringing the community and the college closer together. And she'd worked on the Friends of Art and the Friends of Music and, you know, and, 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 and there were some Waterville people who, who came up to, to the college for uh, those events, but she didn't, uh, and, and the, they were always open. Uh, and uh, we had wonderful speakers coming on the campus, but she was always uh, very regretful that more people from the 
from the, the community that didn't come. So that was her inspiration. Uh, she, uh, <clears throat> she wanted it um, uh, as inclusive and as exciting for the area and not just for Colby. Um, by the way, people did come to the campus um, quite regularly for athletic events. Um, and I became sort of a local hero um, because um, uh, during my first year, I abolished entrance fees to the basketball games and the football games. And people in town thought, oh, this new president, he's really conscious about the community because all the Colby people got in free. The only people I had to pay were people from Waterville. And everybody thought I was just wonderful in cementing town-gown relationships. And, um, and I was happy to, to have that spin-off. But frankly, I, I realized it cost more to hire the ticket takers than we ever took in. <laughs> Um, Linda had a great interest in foreign affairs, of course. Um, we lived in uh, Kaduna, Nigeria, and Bogota, Colombia. We worked on international philanthropy. Um, and, and obviously, Jerry and the other founders of the mid Maine Forum shared that interest in, uh, here we are in Waterville, Maine, but, um, but we are part of the United States, and we're part of the world, and, and to realize those important relationships. Um, uh, I, uh, I was allowed to come to the uh, lectures, and I was to stay quiet. Uh, and if she, would, uh, if she were here tonight, she'd say, that's enough, Bill. Thank you. I, I would now like to introduce Kimberly Flowers, who will come up and, and, and introduce our speaker. So I, I would say this is Kimberly's last day on Colby campus. So for us, it's a sad day. Um, and I think for her, re really. Um, so we will miss her dearly. Uh, but Kimberly, please come up. a lot of things about Colby and Maine, but that includes coffee with Steve and Jerry and, and meeting great people like them who do really care about foreign affairs, which is also incredibly important to me. Um, I hope, of course, as Steve mentioned, that this is just the beginning of a beautiful relationship between the Goldfarb Center for Public Affairs and the mid -Maine Global Forum. It makes sense. It's a beautiful, natural connection because of the things that we care about. Um, and since you mentioned your annual theme next year, know that the theme chosen by the Goldfarb Student Executive Board for us next year is healthcare. So we'll be looking at issues from reproductive rights to unequal access to a variety of things. And we are we doing in-person, open to the public. So I hope you will stay in touch with the Goldfarb Center and come to those events. Um, my pleasure tonight, though, is introducing Heather Conley, who's the president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, an organization that focuses on transatlantic and other multilateral relations. Heather started her career as an intern at the State Department and um, eventually later served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Europe and Eurasian Affairs under former President George W. Bush from 2001 to 2005. She has three decades of experience looking at foreign affairs and public policy issues related to Europe and Eurasia. Um, she's known for being a brilliant uh, public policy analyst and a politically savvy leader, and as I can attest, a very kind colleague. Um, Heather and I worked alongside each other at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, or CSIS, which is a highly ranked bipartisan think tank in Washington, D.C., where Heather served as a senior vice president and a director for 12 years. Um, there aren't enough female leaders in Washington, much less at think tanks. Um, and I highly respected watching and learning from Heather of how she navigated those waters with such intellect and grace. Heather is perhaps probably best known in the DC environment for her publication called The Kremlin Playbook. 
Um, and of course, since the war in Ukraine started, um, you can see her on TV and in press all the time. I'm always like, oh, there's Heather again. Oh, I'm reading Heather again. Um, you know, because of her expertise on transatlantic ties and on relations with Russia, you will see her on CNN, MSNBC, NPR, you name it, Washington Post, and now Colby College. <laughs> So Heather, welcome to Maine. Heather and Mike, her husband, welcome to Maine. We're glad that you're here. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And although I did not have the honor of meeting Linda Cotter, I think it's easy to say that um, she would be very proud and honored to have someone like you here tonight of your caliber to lead us in a discussion on a very complex topic. So Heather, over to you. Well, thank you so much. Kimberly, that was an exceptionally kind introduction. Um, President Carter, Bill, your wonderful family, what an honor and privilege it is for me to give a lecture which supports your wife's vision of bringing informed international discussion to central Maine. I'm your grand finale. I'm <laughs> delighted. I'm delighted. But what I'm really happy about is that you invited me to speak about this important topic, Ukraine, Russia, Europe, the transatlantic relationship. We have a lot to talk about tonight. So why I am going to talk about Ukraine, I promise, I think first we have to talk about taking that holiday from history. And I'm sure when you read the title of this lecture, you were scratching your head wondering, what does she mean about taking a holiday from history? Well, history permeates our understanding of ourselves, who we are, where we came from. It shapes our thinking about the future. Some are forever trapped in history and by history. Others strive to break the cycle of history. While history always informs it can also imprison, but we hope that ultimately it can inspire us in a variety of ways. But do we ever really take a holiday from history? I would argue sometimes we do. Sometimes people, as well as countries, attempt to break out of a ne negative cycle of history. Ukraine today is trying desperately to break out of a very long and devastating cycle of history brought about by its neighbor to the east, Russia. Will this current installment of Russia's war against Ukraine break the cycle? That is what we are going to unpack this evening. But before we do that, we have to talk about breaking out of one of America's own cycles of history. And the breaking of this particular cycle began, and Bill, thank you for advancing my slide. This began 75 years ago on June the 5th, 1947 when U.S. Secretary of State George C. Marshall gave a short yet very powerful speech at Harvard University, and he outlined the European Recovery Program, which became known as the Marshall Plan. This event and uh, subsequent events in 1948, the Berlin Airlift, and 1949, the creation of NATO, has sustained America's holiday from its own history of isolationism we broke out of our cycle and we developed a structured global security and engagement network that has endured for 75 years. So let me explain. The Marshall Plan. This was a big, bold, and very risky American idea. George Marshall, who, Army Chief of Staff, knew Joseph Stalin very well. He went to Moscow in 1947. It was sort of like the last trip to see if he could convince Joseph Stalin to stop breaking all the rules and all the treaties that had been signed after the Second World War. He left Moscow and realized that, that the United States could not work with Uncle Joe anymore. He also was watching Europe in 1947 struggle extraordinarily. Devastated by the Second World War, a crippling winter, people were literally starving. 
They were unable to take care of themselves and they were being lured by communist influence. Again, the Soviet Union saw the opportunity of a very weak and desperate people. And so George Marshall and his team of experts at the State Department set about understanding the crisis in Europe and what the United States could do about it. This was not easy. They, uh, the American people weren't ready for the Marshall Plan. They had done their bit in Europe. It was time to focus at home. Does that sound familiar to you? Well, uh, so the Marshall Plan was created and then the key experts had to sell the Marshall Plan to the American people and they went out across the country convincing others that this is what we needed to do. Now, Joseph Stalin was watching this Marshall Plan and the provision of key humanitarian supplies, food supplies to Europe, and he forbade the Marshall Plan to work in the, form, in the Soviet dominated countries of Central and Eastern Europe. So the Marshall Plan only went to Western Europe in, seven, in 16 countries, although it was certainly a, a, a provided uh, to the, the Warsaw Pact countries if they wished it but they were forbidden. Stalin forbade it. Why? Because he knew that the Marshall Plan provided hope. And hope is a very dangerous thing when you're trying to crush it and influence it. So the Marshall Plan transformed European humanitarian desperation into transatlantic prosperity. European integration and democratic resilience, even for Germany, right after the war. In many ways, the Marshall Plan created today's European Union because it required European integration. As Harry Truman said in 1947, in all the history of the world, we are the first great nation to feed and support the conquered. And it was also clear US leadership in 1948 was needed when Stalin blockaded a divided Berlin. His response, as I mentioned, to the hope of the Marshall Plan the Berlin airlift kept faith with the people of Western Berlin, forcing Stalin to back down after a year. As Truman very succinctly put it, we are going to Berlin, we are going to stay in Berlin, period. Now, the Marshall Plan and the Berlin airlift paved the way for the creation of NATO on April 4th, 1949 in Washington. The US did not walk away from Europe as it had after the First World War. It decided for its own security and prosperity, it had to stay. Now I'm gonna take a quick historic aside and tell you, if you didn't see the news, the Senate just voted by 95 to one yesterday, ratified an amended NATO treaty to welcome Sweden and Finland into NATO. You talk about breaking out of historic cycles. Sweden has been neutral for two centuries. That's what Vladimir Putin just did. But perhaps the best quote uh, from this incredibly historic vote yesterday in the Senate came from Senator Tom Cotton, who said, some critics say America shouldn't pledge to protect countries halfway around the world. These critics are seven decades too late. I thought that was a fantastic statement. We broke our own cycle of history. We remained engaged. Now, as an additional aside, historic aside, let me tell you about the full name of my organization, the German Marshall Fund of the United States, a memorial to the Marshall Plan. We are the living memory of that big, bold American idea. 25 years after the Marshall Plan was announced in 1972, then German Chancellor Willy Brandt, he, he traced Marshall's steps, went to Harvard, and announced a major gift by the German government in gratitude for the Marshall Plan and what it did for the German people. And so this year, we're celebrating the German Marshall Fund's 50th anniversary. And do you know what I spend most of my time talking about? A Marshall Plan for Ukraine. This is how powerful that idea is. In 75 years, it remains even more powerful. The Marshall Plan strengthened our allies to resist communism, uh, and ultimately, this created um, a NATO membership of 32 countries. It was an act of generosity and self-interest, and we broke out of our cycle. But we know isolationism and retrenchment are always, always part of our national discourse. It's grown louder in recent years. 
We want to put ourselves first and not worry about foreign entanglements. Our geography and our military strength do shelter us from a great deal of turmoil, but not all turmoil. So unfortunately, while America may have had its holiday from history, breaking that cycle of isolationism, unfortunately, Europe never seems to be able to have a holiday from its overabundance of very negative history and traumas from the 20th century. In fact, like our holiday from history, Europe has been having a pretty peaceful run of things since 1945 with some occasional interruptions. Central and Eastern Europe continue to suffer profoundly uh, from the traumas of its history, particularly those countries in between empires or revisionist powers. Yale professor Timothy Snyder refers to these lands as bloodlands. And bloodlands are typically found at the intersection of empires particularly as those empires collapse. So the failed post-World War I settlement was an attempt to sort out three collapsing empires simultaneously, the Russian Empire, the Ottoman Empire, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, as well as a budding German Empire. But we are still dealing with the aftershocks well over 100 years later from the First World War. In many ways, the Marshall Plan and the founding of NATO were the supportive structures that tried to, to minimize the, the difficulties of the collapse of empires, even the British Empire and the French empires, to some extent, to confront the rise of the Soviet Union. So for instance, the legacy of the Austro-Hungarian Empire can still be seen today in the instability of the Western Balkans. And let's, let's take the Ottoman Empire. This is one of my favorite pictures. This picture is a, pres is a, is a picture of President uh, Rajiv Tayyip Erdogan of Turkey in his newly constructed 1,100-room Neo-Ottoman White Palace. And he's surrounded by garbs, dr soldiers dressed in all the historic garbs of the Ottoman Empire. Next year, Turkey celebrates its 100th anniversary of its modern founding. Uh, and I would say uh, even President Erdogan has repeatedly said that he would like to tear up the treaty from after the First World War that created the modern Turkish Republic today. He thinks that he wants to create a, a new Ottoman Empire. So those, those feelings of great power status come back very quickly. We can even go back further. The Crimean War of, 19, of 1853 and 1856 was actually the Russian Empire seeking to take advantage over a weakening Ottoman Empire. Now, fast forward to today. Who has negotiated a Ukrainian grain shipment traversing the Black Sea? Well, it was Turkey. Turkey, a NATO ally since 1952, which sold drones to Ukraine, which is currently not implementing Russian sanctions and has welcomed Russian oligarchs fleeing Russia. My friends, these collapsing empires are very complicated, but that is Turkey, and that's an example of the challenges that we face. But the empire that we really want to talk about is the ongoing collapse of the Russian or Soviet empire. Do you believe it was 30 years ago in December that the Soviet Union formally collapsed? If Turkey is still addressing the challenges and imp implications of a collapsing empire 100 years later, we know we are only at the earliest stages of Russia's continuing collapsing empire. And in many ways, Ukraine is a victim of this collapsing empire and Russian revisionism and dealing with this continuing collapse. It is really important to keep in mind, and this is such, a, in some ways, our own myth about ourselves, we did not technically win the Cold War. The adversary simply collapsed under its own weight and illogic. And this collapse was humiliating for the regime and its people. We were not the cause of this humiliation, but this is the humil humiliation that Vladimir Putin constantly speaks about. He felt it deeply as a young um, KGB officer in Dresden, in former East Germany, and then he felt it even more when he returned back to his home in St. Petersburg, Russia. When the Soviet Union collapsed, Russia simultaneously lost its identity, its stature, its history, as well as suffering economically. But this 
is a picture of Ukraine's independence in 1991 and its celebration of ending rule by Moscow. So when Vladimir Putin came to power in 2000, his goal was to restore Russia's greatness, overcoming the great humiliation, and as he called it, the collapse of the Soviet Union was the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. I think you and I would all agree on there'd be very different, different definitions of the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century. Uh, Putin never accepted or acknowledged the sovereignty and independence of, of the former Soviet republics, despite signing many international agreements to the contrary. So Vladimir Putin tried to cooperate with the West as Russia, as when he came to power in 2000, as Russia started to regain its strength. Putin once suggested, believe it or not, that Russia should become part of NATO. And after 9-11, he thought that a new counterterrorism partnership could redefine the great power relationship between the United States and Russia. But it did not. And he believed that the West simply took advantage of Russia's weakness. Seven years after regaining Russia's strength, in 2007, Putin declared at a very important speech at the Munich Security Conference that Russia the, the era of cooperation was over. Russia would assert its interests. And this is exactly the moment when Russia began to rebuild their military. And the following year in 2008, they invaded the Republic of Georgia, occupying 20% of their territory. But this wasn't enough. Putin still needed to create a new post-Soviet identity. So he set about pulling different strands of Russian history together, history from the czarist times, an embrace of Russian orthodoxy to defend traditional conservative values. And then he, he weirdly selected history from Stalinism and the Soviet era. It didn't matter if this, these histories that he was pulling from contradicted one another. He was weaving a new story about Russia. But Putin centered Russia's new post-Soviet identity on the great Soviet victory in the Second World War, or what, we, what the Russians refer to as the Great Patriotic War. Russia's new identity is now centered on its past of defeating the Nazis. But the absurd thing is that their actions have really told, they've become the Nazis or the fascists of the 21st century. They've destroyed their own narrative. Of course, they no longer admit that Stalin ever had a pact with Hitler to divide Poland, because that's not convenient to their truth right now. But this is why Russia keeps incessantly talking about the so-called denazification of Ukraine. This is part now of Russia's history and identity. Ukraine is also thought of in Russian historical terms as being the spiritual heart of Russia, because in medieval times, Kievan Rus, modern-day Kiev today, um, was converted to Christianity in 988. We're going back to history, my friends. And do you know who converted them? Prince Vladimir. Well, it, could Vladimir Putin be the reincarnation of Prince Vladimir? Or perhaps Putin is a modern version of Peter the Great. And he recently said that just like Peter the Great, we will take what was previously ours when Russia was an empire. Well, look out, folks. It, uh, it, it, that means Alaska, because the, the United States purchased Alaska from the Russian empire in 1867. But as you see, the explanation flows from identity, history, culture, selectively. So this is how Putin restored his great power status. So. This brings us to the war in Ukraine. And these are, again, wonderful slides of these historical distortions. This is a picture of Europe will be free. Of course, the Soviet Union will break the bondage that the British and the Americans are holding over Europe. These are other signs, again, do you see the czarist themes coming through and uh, the Soviet themes? 
And the last one, honestly, I just heard on Russian news, they are recasting the, uh, the picture of the, mother, the motherland is calling, the, the great motherland is calling, it is time for us to be reborn. So a lot of these sayings are just being pulled and repurposed and modernized. Okay, so let's, let's go to Ukraine. This is a picture of literally the trenches in Ukraine. The war began, I would argue, in 2005 with Ukraine's first revolution. It was called the Orange Revolution. And it was the first time that the Ukrainian people were trying to separate themselves from Moscow's influence. And then in 2006 and 2009, uh, Russia shut off the energy that transited Ukraine. And then, of course, we accelerated this war in 2014 with Ukraine's revolution of dignity. As you'll recall, Ukraine wanted to join the European Union or have an association agreement, a trade agreement, not join it officially, uh, but even that was too much and the pressure from Russia became so great. And so after the dignity of, uh, the revolution of dignity and the protest culminating in the loss of 7% of Ukraine's territory, 15,000 dead, and massive security attacks. The war eventually culminated in the spring of, 20, uh, of 2021 with the very first troop buildup uh, along Ru Ukraine's border and the reduction of energy supplies to Europe. Looking back, that war began 12 months before February 20, the 4th. And now, as February 24th unfolded, the Russian goal of overthrowing the current government in Kyiv was this culmination. It began in 2005 with steady pressure from, from Moscow, lots of revolutions, Ukraine trying to break free. Can they break this cycle of history? So now we are entering the sixth month of this culminating stage. The war has become absolutely existential for the survival of Ukraine as an independent nation. And it has equally become nearly existential for Vladimir Putin and the survival of his regime. So to put this as simply as possible, this is a race between Russian brutality and Ukrainian resistance supported by the West. Russia believes it can win this race and outlast the West particularly as we head into the most difficult phase of this war in the fall and in the winter. I would argue Russia's military tactics are very similar to Soviet tactics during World War II. Their soldiers plunder goods because Ukrainians are actually more well off than the Russian soldiers that are invading. They forcibly repatriate Ukrainians into Russia, reminding us of how Stalin would remove citizens from the Baltic states and force them into Siberia. They also murder POWs, as they did in World War II, if you recall, uh, the, the Polish uh, POWs in Katyn, what they just did in Olevenka is exactly fits that pattern. But Russian forces don't completely understand why they are fighting in Ukraine. Some didn't know they were actually going to war on February the 24th. They were told that they were going on an exercise. And Putin does not want the Russian people to know that they are at war. That's why he keeps insisting, and you will go to jail if you don't call this a special military operation. The initial justification for this war was to denazify Ukraine and protect ethnic Russians in Ukraine. The majority of the Russian people support this conflict, but honestly, they don't want to think about it at all. And there are those who don't support this war, but they are in jail or they have fled the country. The average Russian doesn't want to believe any information to the contrary and they are being fed a steady diet of ultra-nationalist propaganda. Russia will not stop until they control Ukraine or until the costs of the war challenge Putin's leadership. And if the, they do challenge his leadership, we may have a whole other set of challenges that lie ahead. But for Ukrainians, this is their last war of independence from Russia. Either they will restore their territorial integrity, and this will take a very long time and will be very painful and costly, even under the best of circumstances, or 
we will have a situation akin to a new divided Germany as we did in the Cold War, but this is not going to be a Cold War. This is going to continue to be a destabilizing hot war. The Ukrainian people fully understand what they are fighting for, and they are willing to fight for it at great cost. But this is not just their fight. This is our fight. Russia will not stop until it is stopped. And if it is not stopped in Ukraine, Russia will continue toward NATO members. Because for Putin to survive politically, he must have an enemy, which is the United States and its NATO and EU allies. This is why NATO members are sending weapons to Ukraine and providing economic support to keep Ukraine in the fight. This picture actually took place last month uh, in Madrid at the NATO summit, and this is President Zelensky speaking to uh, two NATO members. What Putin is counting on is that we will stop caring about Ukraine or they are so af or that we are so afraid of an escalation of this conflict that we will agree that, okay, Russia, you can have Ukraine. Europe is about to get very cold this winter as Russia reduces its energy supplies to Europe. Surely Europeans will care more about not shivering and their economies than they ever will think about Ukraine. Surely the U.S. will be distracted by its midterm elections, its high gas prices, inflation, maybe China. The Russians can simply wait us out despite our sanctions. This is Putin's plan. What is our plan? In some ways, we have taken a transatlantic holiday from history the last 75 years thanks to the courage and leadership of the greatest generation. The Marshall Plan and NATO equally protected and rebuilt Europe to ensure its stability and, and prosperity as well as ours. But that holiday is over. The 2014 annexation of Crimea was the equivalent of the German annexation of the Sudetenland. February 24th was akin to September 1st, 1939, when Nazi Germany invaded Poland. And of course, 16 days later, the Soviet Union invaded Poland. We see China's response to Taiwan today and its desire for regional hegemony akin to the empire of Japan's actions in the 1930s. The holiday is over. The future of the international system runs through Ukraine. Will that future be one based on sovereign choice and territorial integrity or spheres of influence? One that upholds the dignity and liberty of the individual or a system which dictates what the individual can or cannot think or say. The United States has strong alliances and many allies, something that Russia and China do not possess. And despite our many problems at home and our many foreign policy blunders, the United States remains so vital to global stability and prosperity. So, as we end our holiday from history and to what I think our best course of action is, what our plan should be, I'm going to paraphrase President Harry Truman. We are going to stand with the people of Ukraine, period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for a wonderful, wonderful cover of really uh, history that we we all sort of know, I think, to some extent. But it is it is so striking that things have we can see all of this coming back, and um, I think most of us are 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 fearful. I, I think, quite honestly. So we're going to have a question and answer time, and I would discussion time. We would. This is a time that we have had after every one of our talks. So we would. Uh, I, I would encourage you to please. We have a mic in the back, and Sherry is there. Uh, please raise your hand, and 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 we'll we'll start. Hi, Heather. Uh, and very much enjoyed your talk. Um, a, a question that just sort of haunts me is that the, the magnitude of the sanctions that the United States and 
Western European countries um, uh, directed towards Russia uh, over time has seemed to be ineffective. And that just actually this blows my mind because <laughs> we've used sanctions against many, many countries over the years and had much more effective, uh, uh, much more effect. So I'm wondering what happened? Well, thank you. It's it's a great question. Um, we uh, at my uh, at former CSIS, we actually had a sanctions tracker on Russia. We were trying to keep up with. Uh, we started sanctioning Russia way back in 2011 for human rights abuses, their actions in Syria, for violations of international treaties. And you're absolutely right. Our sanctions policy generally is like slowly turning up the temperature on the burner. Um, and and what over time though, what the country does is they become very expert at uh, diverting from those sanctions. So they'll find someone who can you know uh, help them out and try to um, to disregard the sanctions. Over Vladimir Putin has used them particularly after the annexation of Crimea uh, Crimea in 2014. Um, he actually used them to his benefit. So it helped him to say, see the see. The enemy is around us. They're trying to weaken us. So we will just create all those products ourselves. And so he used it economically to basically nationalize uh, elements of, of the Russian economy. Where we are today, we are seeing the most severe sanctions ever. Now, you have to separate these sanctions out. Although it makes us feel good to sanction an oligarch, that doesn't really move the, the, the meter here. The most impactful thing that the United States did as the war began was we sanctioned the central bank and we froze their foreign, uh, ex their foreign assets. That was a blow they hadn't anticipated. Um, and of course, the best thing we can do is not buy their oil and gas. We are, this is what I've said this to my European colleagues, you realize you are paying the Russians for the war as you're paying the Ukrainians to fight them. You realize you're paying both sides of this equation and our European colleagues, and we all do, we want this war to end, uh, but we, we need to stop paying the Russians. And as the energy prices have gone up, um, uh, and uh, even though Europe will, will decrease their energy requirements, which will be in the long term catastrophic to the Russian economy in its future, they're not doing it fast enough. And, and the Europeans, uh, as I said, they, they are looking at their economy like we do. They're seeing high inflation. The German economy runs on uh, low-cost Russian energy. This will be devastating, potentially, to the German economy if Russia really does uh, stop all uh, oil and gas going to, to Europe. So we've got to, this is where the sacrifice comes on our end, and that's really hard to explain to to the American people and your wait, we have to sacrifice more for our values in order to punish what Russia is doing. And yes, we have to take that short term hit. Um, it's very, very hard uh, to do. So if we are prepared to take the, the hit or, uh, up front um, and hope that this will cause the Russians to change their position, but it's very hard. Uh, and Europe, as, as I mentioned in my remarks, it could potentially be, you saw the Berlin airlift where literally we were sending uh, humanitarian supplies. We're, you know, there's gonna need to be an energy uh, Berlin airlift equivalent. And quite frankly, we don't have the excess capacity to be able to help Europe. This is, this is going to be a very difficult fall and winter. But if we can completely stop shipping and purchasing Russian energy, which the global economy won't and can't, um, that would be the best thing to alter Mr. Putin's equations. Mr. Putin is also, though, going to, this, the sanctions on supply chains are really going to hit in the fall. And this is the interesting observation. He's going to need help from China. Uh, particularly uh, to help replenish the semiconductors and the things that, I mean, literally the Russian military is not going to be able to make things anymore, which is a good thing. We don't want them to continue to throw material uh, it, towards Ukraine. But um, if, if China decides, if, if Xi Jinping, after the 20, uh, 20th Party Congress in October, if he decides to support Vladimir Putin, then we're going to be sanctioning China as well. 
and this is going to be a massive blow to the uh, global economy, to the American economy. So this is going to continue to, to ripple effect. We'll see if China uh, provides assistance to Russia economically or whether they will stay clear and not uh, so have those sanctions. So American sanctions are powerful, powerful. European sanctions are powerful for sure. Uh, but Mr. Putin has very capably managed this uh, pretty well. We'll see how, we how well he does in the fall and the winter, but we're gonna have to do more, unfortunately. Thanks. Thanks. Jerry? Just to follow up on that, uh, Russia is selling oil to Saudi Arabia. There's a microphone coming to you in one quick second so everyone can hear you. I want everyone to hear your good question. Yeah, uh, just to follow up on that, uh, Russia apparently is selling ample oil to both China and uh, India and uh, at uh, fairly high prices. So their revenue from oil really hasn't taken a hit. So how do we make sanctions work if they can continue to get oil revenue from other yeah. oligarchs? So um, Russia is actually selling their, their oil at a deep discount to China in India. Um, and as Europe weans themselves eventually off Russian energy, this will, this will be eventually catastrophic to the Russian economy. Again, the, the Russian economy is based on energy exports and commodity, natural commodities, wheat, but also uh, natural minerals, nickel, iron ore, palladium. Um, that's, that is their export. They miss the diversification of their economy. They don't have a Silicon Valley. They don't, they've just state owned uh, exports. So the war will be traumatic to their economy, but as I said, it's it's a t we have a time problem here. The race, the race for that impact to happen isn't fast enough um, for Ukraine as uh, Russia continues to to pummel it literally. But this is going to harm I, again. I, as I alluded to, what I think policymakers aren't thinking more about is you know the potential future fragmentation and collapse of, of Russia, the decisions that Putin has made for his economy, the, the, the depopulation after COVID, um, I mean, if, if there are the numbers, we don't know, but I would say we're probably in, you know, 20,000 killed in Ukraine, probably 20 to 25,000 wounded. Um, that's their young male population. So the, the demographic picture, the economic picture, gets extremely dire, which in some ways is, is what's causing Russia to, to, to take these very costly and dramatic steps to, to try to shift the international system so that they can play this out. Uh, but it's going to, it, we will, this will be devastating to the Russian economy. It's not happening on the time schedule that it is. And eventually, uh, the energy transitions as Europe uh, goes to renewables, as the you know we 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 reduce our fossil fuel uh, use globally. Russia's economy, like the Saudi Arabia's economy, will be profoundly challenged. We just don't have the time right now. Ukraine doesn't have the time right now to to see that devastation hit. But it, it's it, it's having impact. The price of oil, though, is just so high right now that it's filling the Russian coffers. Uh, right now, and they've placed capital controls on their economy, so they're not feeling that intensity that they should be. But eventually, it will catch up with them. Uh, yes, I just, you can hear me? Um, yes. For uh, Putin's new narrative to work, um, you would assume that he would have to convince a large percentage of the population in Russia now. Um, how is that working? Um, in terms of information or disinformation, um, and uh, what might be done to counteract that? It's working incredibly well inside of Russia. When Putin returned to the Kremlin in 2012, um, prior uh, prior to his announced return, they uh, he experienced the largest demonstrations of his tenure in 2011 because Rus the Russian people felt the election was being stolen and being manipulated. So once he stole and manipulated that election, when he got back to the to the Kremlin, he was prime minister and then he became president again. 
it was the beginning of the shutdown of Russian civil society and Rus any meaningful Russian opposition, which there really wasn't that much. And he began taking control. There were independent Russian newspapers and there was independent radio. Uh, Russians get their news primarily by television and radio. Now there's a vibrant internet um, in the major cities, but not in St. Petersburg, Moscow, but not in the rural areas. So basically, as I said, Putin was just, looking back, we missed all of these signs of preparation, to be perfectly honest with you. He cracked down so much internally to Russia. So if you had connections to a Western think tank or Western sources, you were deemed a foreign agent and then you were deemed an undesirable, and you got your bank accounts shut down. If you didn't stop it, then you were going to jail. So you couldn't protest. They would shut that down. Anyone, this is like Alexei Navalny, the Russian opposition leader. He had the, the courage to keep fighting, and he was poisoned, and now he's in jail. They have silenced everything, and he controls the, the media. And this is what's been very disheartening to many of us that have worked with Russian organizations and think tanks for many, many years. Um, the, the Russian people, after 2014, the annexation of Crimea and the invasion of Ukraine was extremely popular. It, str it surprised Putin, I think, how popular it was. And it was getting back to that, yeah, you know, that greatness. Like, you can't push us around anymore. We will take what we want to take. I think the regime was very surprised how popular it was. Now, that that effect you know, went down a little bit as average life and things and hardships uh, came into it. This time, Putin is controlling the narrative, but it's so interesting. He hasn't called for a full mobilization of Russian soldiers. I mean, they are literally pulling people off streets to forcing them into conscription. He's doing that because he's concerned. Even though he controls Russian opinion, he has no opposition. He's very concerned if he makes a decision for a full mobilization uh, to, to win the war, that the Russian people will, will really push against him. And so his regime is shaky in a way, although you wouldn't think that because he has such control. But what's so dis just so sad, the, the majority of the Russian people support this. They believe what they're being told, the denazification, and you know this is to um, to protect, and this is about our history, and um, and most of the polling that we've seen recently, they're just trying to shut it out. They don't want to listen to it anymore. But you know this fall, when unemployment starts to increase because of all the Western companies that have removed themselves for Russia, when the stores are shelves are empty, just like in the Soviet times where they can't get goods. In fact, for the first time, this is just history coming back. The Russian government just announced that they now have separate kiosks. So if you pay in euros or dollars, you can shop at this store for foreign goods. That was exactly during the Soviet Union. The nomenclatura, the the elite could could shop, and the rest of you had to fight for the bread in the in the state stores. It's those memories are coming back now. We the Russian people have had 30 years of travel, of 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 freedom, and we'll see how they react to this going inside. Right now, it's okay, but this is why I think we are going to see internal unrest in Russia and a regime that is very fragile uh, as this plays out. So I think, as I said, r as empires collapse they continue to collapse. And I think we'll see a lot uh, greater dynamics, which are a little more frightening, to be honest with you. So uh, in the face of our own political instability and uh, the effectiveness of Russian disinformation, how much do you think our population is willing to suffer for this issue? It is a great question, and that's, that's why I said that's what Putin is counting on. He's counting on the decadence and the weakness of the West. Um, so we certainly know Russian disinformation is a powerful tool. Um, at the German Marshall Fund, we actually, I, I recommend it, we have a, a project called the Alliance for Securing Democracy that we, uh, that the organization put together in 2016 after the election, and we, the project literally tracks Russian disinformation 
Chinese disinformation. And so we see what's tracking and what's trending in the United States, who is, who is increasing it. So I'll just give you a very powerful example of several years ago. You'll remember the, um, the NFL and players that were taking a knee. Uh, for because of the terrible, terrible um, violence in the African American community, and wanting police uh, to have a better response to that. Do you know what the number one trending Russian disinformation during that whole time was? Take a knee. They were amplifying our divisions. What we've seen in Russian disinformation, they they amplify both sides. They want us to fight each other. They want to make sure, because it, in some ways, it, it, what they do, and they report every violence, every, every problem that we have in the United States, they show it back to the Russian people and say, that's, that, that's chaos. You couldn't possibly want that. You don't want democracy. That's what that chaos brings. So they elevate it. Uh, and then they, they send it back. And it, it's that reinforcing cycle. I've done a, a recent research on how a Russian disinformation influence is influencing uh, the evangelical community and the faith-based community. It's, it, 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 to me, it is, it is the saddest. I'm a, a minister's daughter. Um, and you know, our, the founding of our country is on you know, the separation of church and state, that everyone has the right to, to have their beliefs or not to have their beliefs. They are using Russian disinformation is amplifying this decadence of the West and, of course, the, the difficult societal conversations we're having. Um, and, and they are amplifying the culture wars. Anything that divides us, they exploit weakness. That is what they are great at doing. And after the, the war, the February 24th war began, Europe was shutting down Russia Today, RT and Sputnik. And you know who picked up right after the same information? China. China's disinformation channels just, just amplified because they weren't shut down. So these two are actually working together. They're amplifying that. It's they need to show that we are weak, that we, we're, there's nothing attractive about us because we have allies that are attracted to us. We do attract economically and, and from a security perspective, so they need to amplify uh, our disinformation. We're watching very closely the US midterm elections um, for, for disinformation. Again, Russia, China, Iran, others. We, you know, I like to say um, the, the battlefield today is the American mind. Uh, and what we listen to and what we read and how we communicate with one another and our civility, they understand that's our weakness and that's what they're exploiting today. So it's something all, all Americans need to be extremely vigilant, fact check, don't take that thing from Twitter, it's gospel. You know, you, you make sure you tell family members, let's make sure we're getting the right information, it's factual based because we pass this stuff around so fast and it's not true. I think you're exactly right. I, 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 I I see in America, I think all of us see, but this, this, um, this schism has been exploited for all sorts of reasons. So, um, and, and it's scary because you can see that that becomes our weakness. That becomes what makes us vulnerable to allowing really uh, a challenge to the essence of democracy and democratic states. Um, are there any other questions? Yeah, please, please, yeah. What, excuse me, what would happen if Putin was assassinated? Well, I'm more worried about President Zelensky being assassinated, to be honest with you. Um, and in fact, this is, obviously, this was the goal of uh, Putin in the first three days of the war is to de decapitate the Ukrainian government. But we know and have reports of there's still... Uh, forces trying to, uh, because I, that would be devastating because Zelensky really is, at this point, he is the glue that's holding this together. I mean, he is rewriting the modern communication handbook for world leaders. I can't begin to tell you how transformative he was. I think Putin, to be honest with you, is very safe right now. Um, again, we... You know, I think hoping that we sanctioned all these oligarchs, you know, we slap girlfriends that, you know, are traveling in Europe, they can't, you know, trying to take all those privileges that we'd start to see oligarch on oligarch behavior, we're, we're not. It's been sort of a, a cleansing loyalty test. He is, he is secure 
for now in his leadership, but I think this gets much more difficult for him, and is it, I'm, I'm not gonna tell you a happy story here, because he, this is what he did in 2014 when he annexed Crimea, he never used to use these ultra-nationalistic terms. He always kept them sort of securely in a box. He needed those furies to come out to justify what he was doing in Ukraine. And once you let those furies out, if you, as you, I follow and read the transcripts of Russian television, like their Sunday news programs and their evening news programs, these guys are, it's, it's insane. It's, you know, we're going, we have to cleanse the situation and using, you know, nuclear weapons. We will, we will take all of this territory. It's, it's so, it's insane. What I worry is if Putin sees in the fall and the winter that this isn't working, this is, you know, this is imperiling his leadership. He needs to take a step back. He needs to uh, have some more options. Um, I, I worry that he has so emboldened these ultra-nationalists that if he takes a step back, someone will say, oh, no, we're not. We're not taking a step back. Either you're going to keep going and taking the step forward, or we will you know, put people that will continue this. I, I worry that he, doesn't, he can't back up anymore because he's un unleashed this. Now, having said that, because of his control over the media, he can wake up tomorrow and say there's a different reason for what they're doing and declare victory and say it's okay if they just hold Luhansk Oblast and the South. But this is the problem. He is now, Putin has set his country and his leadership on a trajectory that it's very difficult uh, to see. Yes, he can keep in control and bring that country to, you know, to its knees, but there are other forces in that country, uh, and particularly around him, ultra-nationalists um, and the military, to you know, potentially take much more dire steps. That's where there's concern about escalation. So he is safe for now, but as we know, authoritarian regimes are so brittle. They look so strong but really they are so brittle mm -hmm. and fragile and we don't have great line of sight around Putin right now. It's like criminology. Uh, we're, we're back to seeing who sits beside him on the parade and his health and you know, does the, what is the blanket? He's shaking his hands. I mean, this I is yeah. Sovietology yeah. in the 21st century and we really don't have good, good information. Let me, let me just follow on to that. And, and so what, what would you say would be that situation that would push Putin to go nuclear, to use a nuclear weapon? So there's two schools of thinking here. One very well-placed Russian oligarch said in an interview, he did not believe that Putin would use a tactical nuclear weapon because he is concerned that the Russian military would not follow the order. And I, it, what, what struck me as interesting about that, um, right after the February 24th, Putin did um, you know, announce that Russia was increasing its nuclear posture, was heightening its, its nuclear posture, combat-ready posture, which did not, does not exist in Russian nuclear military doctrine. And very quickly that same day, the head of Russia's strategic forces came out and said, there has been no change in the Russia, Russia's nuclear doctrine. And I actually thought that was a really important insight that said, you know, he, Putin wanted, what he was doing was, West, be very careful. You be, fear my nuclear weapons, because I will use them. And what his military was saying is, we are professional, we follow doctrine we haven't changed our status. So that's one theory. The other, the other theory is um, if, this, if things go badly for the Russians, that, so if the Ukrainians, and this is a big if, are able to push Russian forces out of the south, most importantly, just so they can uh, have coastal access to the Black Sea, but if they are able through insurgency and through military to push them back, this would be a humiliation for Putin. How does he handle that? Do you what they you know? Do you uh, do you escalate uh, in order to dominate that situation? That's certainly where the Biden administration is extremely concerned. That you know, this is where we can't you know, President French President Emmanuel Macron says we can't humiliate Putin and we can't paint him in the corner. The tragedy he's painting himself in this corner. 
Um, and he knows that he saber rattles the nuclear device and we will go, okay, okay, okay. Well, okay, what? Uh, so he'll continue to use that. So that it's, it's incredibly challenging. This is why it's so important that we keep military to military channels open. Um, and that was the scariest part of the early days of, of the war. We have a hotline, uh, General Milley and our chairman of our Joint Chief Staff with uh, General Gerasimov in Russia. They weren't picking up the phone. And that phone's so important because if we see them doing something that we don't understand, what are you doing? And, and if no one's picking up saying, this is an exercise or this is what we're doing, we could miscalculate. And that's what, now that, that, that they're better in that department now, but that's something we have to worry about. I think we have time for one more question. I yes. apologize. I have very long-winded and long answers, so I'm, I'm making sure you don't oh, answer go. all these questions. Go, I please. apologize. Well, it's such a pleasure to listen to you, and I, as a historian, I deeply appreciate your reaching back even to the Versailles um, setting. And um, I have to say, as a specialist on Nazi Germany in the 1930s and 40s, it's absolutely scary and deeply depressing to see those flashbacks, also the suspicion um, of um, foreigners and foreign spies in the Soviet Union, some remindful of uh, um, Stalinism. Although I would differ with you in one point. You mentioned the um, annexation of Ukraine as an equivalent to the um, annexation of the Sudetenland. I would say the Sudetenland was sanctioned internationally by the British and the French and the Italians. Um, but I do see this an analogy for the occupation of the rest of Czechoslovakia only six months later. But I wanted to ask you something, um, your thoughts about something that's very dear to me. And I think that that is international law. Um, there were two periods of hope for international law. Right after 1945, the Genocide Convention, Human Rights Convention, this idea that the world could be together to prevent these uh, incredible atrocities of um, the Second World War. And then again, after 1990, to some extent, it never worked very well but there were at least some steps toward the advancement of international law. Am I just hopefully illusory? Is this a, um, a f vain hope that at some point humans can work together within, in a framework of international law that everybody more or less respects? Well, thank you for that wonderful question, and I feel like you should have given this lecture perhaps much better than, than myself. So thank you, thank you for, for providing that great clarity. So my observation, and, and I think we've all seen where, you know, there was such promise and hope at the end of the Cold War to create these new treaties. I guess I come down, the problem is with the best of international law, you need someone to enforce when someone violates, and that has what's honestly what's been missing for the last 20 years. And sometimes the United States violates this, so I, I don't mean to, to suggest that, but let's just use an example of, of chemical weapons use in Syria. Um, yes, uh, we sanctioned, um, yes, uh, but, but it didn't stop. It didn't stop because it was done in many ways with impunity. And I, I have to say that the most devastating quote that I had heard, and this was in the very early days after February the 24th, um, it was Syrian white helmets telling the Ukrainian government, don't give the UN your hospital, your medical information. It's infiltrated. It will, uh, it will be used to bomb the hospitals. And that's what happened in Syria. And, and there was some you know, potential evidence of that. This is, it is utterly depressing, but this is why, and, and I understand so well why the American people say, why, why, why do we, why are we have to be sent in? Why are we the policemen um, of this? But it, international law is a wonderful treaty on paper, but it has to be enforced if it's violated. Who wants to enforce that? We don't want to enforce that. Can't somebody else do that? That is the problem, and it's been, you know, the impunity of it. And this is where, this is why this is the test of our generation, because we have two powers that want to reorganize the international system to their preferences. So Russia and China believe that the post-1945 system had, they didn't have their interests in heart. It had our interests in heart. We were the victors. We, we created that system. They now want to change the system for their policy preferences. They want spheres of influence. They want to control regionally what happens. And 
China is a different lecture, which I hope you bring a Chinese scholar here. I have a few recommendations if you'd like to really understand China, but you can see where these two powers, historic grievance, the West has kept them down. This is their moment. They see us as weak and in decline, and this is their time to shift the international system. It is our challenge to, again, show our strength, our courage, our strength and of our allies, we have to meet this moment. It's a scary moment. Uh, it was very scary in the Second World War. We've had scary moments. I say with confidence we can meet this moment. And I'm so grateful to Linda Cotter for giving me the opportunity to share that we have to meet this moment. So thank you so much. Well, thank you so much for a wonderful... This, um, we, aren't, we, aren't, we aren't yet done, but, but we do want to thank you for, for an incredibly thoughtful, and, and it makes us think. It does just what we try to do, which is to cause all, the, you know, cause all of us to, to think a little more deeply about the world around us and what is, what is happening. Um, before we let you go, I'd like to ask Kimberly to come up. Thank you. We have a small gift. Goldfarb Center has some great, great swag. And we want you to leave remembering how wonderful this event is. And thank you so much. I mean, could we have had a better speaker? I don't know. <laughs> On such a great topic. You're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So I thank all of you for coming. Uh, we will be out there and doing more lectures as the year goes on. We hope to see you all again. I want to say thank you so much. You have been a wonderful, wonderful speaker. Your husband, Mike, have, has been great here. And, and uh, I, I would say, as a sidelight, we, we got a chance to have them take them to Belfast today. And <laughs> and uh, enjoy a little bit of Maine, a lobster roll and, you know, walk, in, uh, walk down the Harbor Walk in Belfast. But welcome to Maine. We hope you come back. Thank you so much. <laughs>